Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Amichai, for the kind introduction, and um, Mariela for organizing this uh, wonderful conference and the invitation to um, come here and tell you about our work. So I'm a researcher at the Weizmann Institute, and um, several years ago, uh, just my conflicts of interest, and several years ago, about eight years ago, um, we started this journey of trying to understand what uh, healthy nutrition is. Um, and uh, when we uh, started to think about this, the first thing that we, uh, that we thought about was what marker of healthy nutrition should we even follow? Um, and after giving it a lot of thought and do, doing a lot of reading, actually uh, reading also Gary Tao's book, which, is a, which, which was a big inspiration for the research, um, we decided to focus not on changes in weight, which ultimately we'd like to have an effect on, but we thought that if you look at weight, the problem is that you're only looking at a single measure that takes weeks or months to change, and then it's also going to be very hard to attribute the change in weight to what happened in your diet over the past several months, because, uh, uh, because your change in weight over weeks or months is going to be related to everything you ate and not just nutrition. Um, and, uh, and it's not a measure of the outcome of an individual meal. So, so after thinking about it a lot, we decided to look at the post-meal, post-prandial glucose response. Um, so this, um, as you know, when after you eat a meal and your body digests the carbohydrates and releases them as glucose in the bloodstream, your body secretes insulin to lower uh, these glucose levels. And uh, as uh, uh, Gary told you also yesterday, this is now understood as one of the mechanisms, primary mechanisms, by which we gain weight. Um, so, so we decided to focus on this because this is something that with continuous glucose monitors, we can actually measure continuously in people with uh, these sensors that uh, can go up to one or two weeks. And so if you think about it, in one or two weeks, an average person would eat about 50 large and small meals, so you would get 50 quantitative measures of healthy nutrition in that individual um, uh, over the course of one week. So compare that to a single measure that you get from, change, uh, from looking at a change in weight, which again takes also weeks or months to, to look at. Um, and this uh, postprandial glucose response, in addition to uh, its relevance to weight management and to uh, uh, progression and prevention, um, of diabetes, it's also been linked to multiple uh, other uh, cardiovascular disease and, and numerous other diseases. So, so with this uh, uh, idea in mind, we, we started in Israel, this was uh, about uh, six or seven years ago when we started recruiting, we started what we call the Personalized Nutrition Project. We recruited 1,000 participants here in Israel, connected them to this continuous glucose monitor. At the time, it was a sensor that measured uh, the glucose levels every five minutes for, uh, for a week. During that week, participants logged everything they ate on a mobile app that we developed. They selected the foods from a database of 10,000 uh, foods for which we had full nutritional values, and we gave them scales, so they measured uh, what they ate. So we had full nutritional values for uh, around 50,000 meals. And we can take the area under the glucose curve as a single quantitative measure for the response to that meal. So, so the data set that we collected was, as far as we know, the largest data set collected for uh, this problem of, of 50,000 uh, um, 50, blood glucose responses in 1,000 people. Um, together with those uh, measurements, we also obtained a comprehensive profile from individuals, which included medical background and food frequency questionnaires, blood tests, various uh, uh, physiological measurements, and at the time, the most novel component that we integrated was also uh, the gut microbiome uh, data. So we profiled both with 16S and with full metagenomic sequencing. We measured the bacterial content of, of people uh, in the gut by lo looking at stool samples. So in terms of our cohort, it was uh, fairly represented, representative of the non-diabetic population in Israel because we purposely excluded people with diabetes uh, in this cohort. So it was uh, uh, roughly um, uh, fairly uniform in terms of age between 25 and 70, about 55% overweight, 22% obese, 21% pre-diabetic, pre fairly representative, again, of the adult uh, non-diabetic Israeli population. Um, if we, just to give you a sense of the data, this is uh, continuous glucose monitor CGM data from one participant for an entire week, measured every five minutes. The 
Purple stripes represent when this participant reported uh, going to sleep. If we zoom in on one day, we can see glucose levels going up. After this participant reported eating either breakfast, lunch, or dinner, they go up to different levels after each meal, depending on what the person had to eat. And, and again, we can take this area under the glucose curve in the two hours after the meal as a single quantitative measure of the response uh, to that meal. And we had, we had 50,000 such, uh, such measurement. So the first question that we asked with this data is how do different people respond when they eat exactly the same meal? And to do that, um, the study was actually a free-living study. We wanted to purposely look at what people normally uh, have, um, uh, are eating and how they respond to it. But on the mornings, we actually supplied the breakfasts. So all the breakfasts were uh, not very tasteful breakfasts. They were uh, either just plain bread, uh, bread with butter, glucose, or uh, fructose. Uh, the first three meals were uh, given in duplicates for each person, and they consumed it in the morning after the night fast, which allowed us to compare the response of the same person to the same meal on different days versus different people on um, uh, responding, eating the same meal. So, so we gave these, these breakfasts, about 7,000 of these breakfasts that, that we supplied, uh, and what we found, the first striking finding of the, of the study, was that when the same person eats the same meal, the response is not identical, but highly reproducible, very highly correlated for all of the different meals. Here represents one individual uh, eating one of these meals on two different days, and you can see there's a very high correspondence. But when we look at different individuals eating the same meal, we see a very wide distribution. The x-axis is that quantitative measure of the area under the glucose curve, the response to the meal, and the y-axis represents the number of people with that particular response, and you can see that it's a very wide distribution for all of these meals, meaning that for any one of these, you have participants uh, that had a very high response, others having a mild response, and others having very low responses. In fact, if you uh, look, these are four participants shown uh, uh, here anecdotally, but, but typical of what we saw. Uh, you can see uh, part four participants having highly reproducible responses on different days, but highly variable responses between them. Uh, the, this participant, for example, eating four slices of bread, 50 grams of available carbohydrates, having no blood glucose response, and then another one having a mild response and another having a very high response. So, uh, and this variability, it, it wasn't just that some people had a high response to anything that they ate. We actually could, uh, according to these meals, find some clusters where uh, most of the p individuals had the highest response to glucose, but then another 35% had the highest response to bread, and, and about 15% had the highest response to bread with butter. Um, and although this was more rare, but we also found cases where two people had opposite responses. So one participant having a higher response to glucose than to bread, and another having a higher response to bread than glucose. Typically, uh, these, are, these cases are somewhat more rare, and typically you see uh, you see differences that are uh, more in the, uh, say, 20, 30 percent, but accumulated over many meals, these can, we think, make a very big difference. So, so uh, just to pause on this result of showing striking differences in how different people respond to different meals, we believe that this already has many implications, and shown here uh, uh, on, on the largest scale uh, that, uh, that was shown uh, uh, before, because uh, we think that if this is indeed true, and we see this for every meal, then it means that any universal, one-size-fits-all nutritional recommendations that we'll ever give are always going to have limited efficacy in terms of balancing blood sugar levels, because every meal is going to have variability in the response across different people. It also means that concepts that we've been using, like the glycemic index, are also going to have limited efficacy, because if you think about it, what is the glycemic index? It's you take um, some number of people, say 10 or 20 people, but the number doesn't matter. You measure the response to some food, in this case uh, bread, and, um, and you average the response, and that's the glycemic index of the meal. So that con this concept can be very useful if the people that you measure have very similar responses from which you compute the average. However, if you compute the average from people that have very different responses, then yes, you can compute the average, you can arrive at the same average, but what does this average mean for a random person 
So for these people here, it will have a very different meaning than for these people here. And, and by and large, we see that the situation is that for all the foods that we tested, there's a great deal of variability. And I'll show you this for uh, some foods for which we've tested multiple people and multiple times each person. So uh, every um, uh, column here on the x-axis is a different individual. The dots represent the different measurements of that individual consuming this particular meal, in this case, whole meal bread. And, and you can see fairly reproducible responses within a person but high variability between people. And, and this is true, this is for bananas, uh, ice cream, this is true for every uh, food that we tested, um, omelet meals, granola, uh, salmon-based meals, schnitzels, which are popular in Israel. So, um, so, so we believe that, uh, therefore, this result already was, in our view, the first main finding from the study, and it has, had, has many, uh, many uh, implications. So after showing this variability, we wanted to see what can explain this variability, what associates, associates with this variability. So we returned to the very large profile of measurements that we measured about people. And indeed, we found that multiple different parameters, like various parameters in the blood, were in correlation with the variability in the response of different people to different meals. But the most novel finding of uh, our study was the many different associations that we found between different aspects of gut bacteria and the response of individuals to these different meals. So for example, if you had enrichment or certain uh, uh, metabolic pathways of bacterial genes in your gut bacteria, that was associated with a higher response to some of these meals. So, so th those were uh, uh, many individual correlations and associations that we found. And we then asked whether we can somehow take all of these individual associations and unify them into a single coherent model that would predict personalized blood glucose responses to meals. Um, and just to show you the state of the art before we started our research was to just do carbohydrate counting. So just count the amount of carbs in the meal and, and that would be your predictor for the response. And, and when you do that, obviously there is a signal and, and you can see the signal here. This is the raw data. These are all the 50,000 meals that we recorded, every dot is a single meal, the x-axis is the amount of carbs in the meal, the y-axis is the response, and, and there is a trend. The correlation is 0.38, it explains about 15% of the variability in the response, but this is probably not an algorithm or a predictor that you would want to make your meal choices by. It, it has a signal, but it's a poor predictor. There's many meals that it would tell you that, uh, that, uh, that you can eat many low, se several low-carb meals that would still elicit a high response, at least in some people. Nevertheless, uh, carbohydrate counting is, is how um, uh, uh, people with type 1 diabetes still today determine how much insulin uh, to, uh, to inject. So we asked whether we can somehow use our data and uh, improve upon that. So uh, we used a machine learning uh, framework um, which basically means that we took the data from some participants and, and we trained an algorithm to learn the mapping between the content of the meal, parameters about the individual, and the response. And then we evaluated the model on a group of people that was held out whose data was not given to us when training the model. As the different features for the model, we used uh, uh, many different features coming from the gut bacteria, but then uh, many features coming from the meal itself, the macro and micronutrient contents of the meals, uh, various recorded features like the time at which people ate the meal, how much they slept before, whether they exercised before the time from the previous meal, uh, and the other uh, parameters from the blood test, from the questionnaire, various questionnaires. So putting all of this uh, together, the model zoomed in on uh, a, a bit over 100 parameters that were the most uh, predictive, and uh, we were able to very significantly improve the prediction, not to a perfect prediction, but uh, very significantly better than what exists today, now explaining close to 50% of the variability in the response and, and eliminating much of this uh, uh, more dangerous zone of meals that would predict it to be good, but would actually elicit a high response. And, and we were also very happy to see that after de oops, developing the model, on the first 800 participants, uh, we recruited 100 new participants, profiled them, and were able to uh, achieve very similar results. 
So uh, then the final thing that we did in this study, which we published four years ago, was to ask whether we can take this algorithm and design personalized diets that would balance blood glucose levels in people. And so initially we did a short-term intervention. Uh, in a moment I'll tell you about a clinical trial that we finished for a long-term six months intervention. But this was a short-term intervention only on 26 participants. We randomized them into uh, each participant receiving two diets designed by the algorithm, which were equal in the amount of calories. But in one, the algorithm predicted meals that would elicit a high re blood glucose response, and in the other, with the same amount of calories, um, uh, low uh, blood glucose responses. Uh, most of the, these participants that we recruited were people with prediabetes. Uh, here's uh, two menus given to uh, one participant. Um, uh, one of them is, is the good diet for, predicted by the algorithm for this participant, the other uh, the bad diet uh, for, uh, predicted by the algorithm. You can take a moment to see if, if you could perhaps guess uh, which one is, uh, is the good one and which one is the bad one. Actually, maybe um, out of interest, let's show, see by a show of hands who thinks uh, the diet on the right was predicted to be the good one. And who thinks uh, the diet on the left was predicted to be the good one? Okay. Usually when I do this, it's... it's, it's... Sorry? You want a third one. Yeah, yeah. No, I know, I know, I know that all these diets, they, they do have carbohydrates in them. Um, but, uh, um, but I'll show you. That, so actually most of you here predicted correctly that... Uh, the diet on the right was predicted to be the good one. And I'll show you what happened when we gave this diet to this particular participant and looking at their, her CGM data for a full week. So this is um, on the bad diet. We can see many spikes in blood glucose levels reaching abnormally high glucose levels after meals, indicating that this participant is indeed pre-diabetic. But then the same participant... On, on this diet with, uh, with the ice cream every day for, for a week, the hummus and the pita. Uh, uh, this participant who is pre-diabetic with exactly the same amount of calories achieved fully balanced uh, blood sugar levels for uh, an entire week on the diet that I just showed you. Uh, here's another case, uh, two diets given to the algorith by, by the algorithm. Again, you can take a moment to, uh, uh, to look at these. Uh, in this case, also the diet on the right was predicted to be the one uh, better one by the algorithm. And indeed, when tracking it by continuous glucose monitor, it, it performs uh, much better. And for most participants in the study, we, we saw um, very significant differences between the diet predicted by the algorithm to be the bad one and the diet predicted uh, to be the good one. So I'll skip this. So uh, after finishing the study... Um, the, the, the main question that we were asked justifiably and we also asked ourselves is, okay, but what happens if you follow these diets for a longer term? Can you get meaningful clinical, out, uh, clinical improvements and not just look at the CGM trace uh, for an entire week? So, uh, so we took on this challenge and uh, just a month ago we finished a clinical trial that took us three years to, uh, to carry out. A um, uh, very huge uh, effort uh, by the lab. So this trial was on people with prediabetes. We recruited 200 participants, randomized them into two different arms, one receiving the standard of care diet. This is the diet recommended today by the American Diabetes Association for people with diabetes or prediabetes. Uh, very similar to a Mediterranean diet. And uh, on the other arm, we have the diet based on the algorithm, which would differ between people. And because these are people with prediabetes, the primary outcomes that we looked at were um, a glycemic control outcomes. So we looked at changes in average glucose levels, which we measured either conventionally by hemoglobin A1C, or we think much more accurately by attaching a CGM to every participant for the entire duration of half a year of uh, intervention. And uh, another primary outcome that we had was to see how much we are able to reduce the amount of time that people spend above this critical level of 150 milligrams per uh, deciliter. Um, and then purposely, just because we were mainly interested in comparing the effects of the diet and hopefully independent of weight loss, 
we actually did not perform caloric restriction. We, we prescribed the amount of calories to each person such that we would achieve weight maintenance. That was the aim. Uh, we did achieve weight loss in the end, but it was similar between arms. And we did not tell participants, we told participants to maintain whatever physical activity they were doing until now. So, uh, so purposely, we only wanted the single variable difference between the arms to be the diet. So the way the study was structured, we had a one month of profiling where we asked participants to maintain their habitual diet, the diet that presumably led them to developing the condition of prediabetes. Uh, and then the intervention was for half a year, and we had another half a year of follow-up. And uh, throughout the entire one month of profiling and six months of intervention, participants were connected to a CGM uh, 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 throughout this entire uh, period. Uh, secondary uh, outcomes that we looked at uh, had to do various uh, metabolic uh, uh, endpoint outcomes. We also have exploratory endpoints, which we haven't analyzed yet, like looking at changes in uh, metabolites in the blood and changes in the microbiome, which could have uh, uh, interesting implications and uh, possibly uh, uh, interesting opportunities for therapeutics. And another important aspect of the study, also typically not done in standard trials of nutrition, is that we uh, uh, gave participants a mobile app and we asked them to log everything they eat during the profiling period and during the half year of intervention. So this way we could really assess adherence and compliance to the diet. Now I can't tell you that everybody logged everything that they ate for seven months, but if we look at the 80% of the top loggers in the study, they logged about 80% of the calories they were supposed to eat uh, every day. So, uh, so a very high, uh, relatively very high uh, ability to uh, follow and track what uh, people um, were actually eating. So uh, I'll show you some results, starting by some anecdotal examples. So here's one participant, uh, pre-diabetic. All of these people here are pre-diabetic. Uh, this is uh, one full month trace of CGM data. Uh, when this participant was on his habitual diet, you can see many spikes in blood glucose levels. This is in the one month before our intervention. And then we apply, uh, we start the intervention. This is the uh, one full month trace of CGM data when the participant was eating according to the algorithm. And you can see that virtually eliminated the uh, spikes in glucose levels. Uh, this is now uh, for the entire half year of uh, intervention. And if we quantify this, then this participant prior to the intervention was spending over two and a half hours every day above this critical level of 150 milligrams per deciliter on the algorithm diet on average spending now less than five minutes every day. Uh, here's an example of another participant on the top left, the uh, CGM data prior to the intervention and then uh, the six months of intervention where you can also by eye here see a great reduction in, uh, in the spikes. Here's another participant and another one. And in contrast, if we look at people on the standard of care diet, here's one participant. Uh, this is the one month of uh, um, uh, profiling, so before the intervention. And these are the half a year of the intervention on the Mediterranean diet. So this is what happens. Uh, this is, people don't, of course, measure this and don't look at this, but this is what uh, CGM trace of uh, participants would look like if you follow a Mediterranean diet. And, and here's another uh, such example, uh, which by eye, it's hard to, to see the change. If we, if we now go and quantify this statistically on the entire cohort, 100 participants who finished in each arm, uh, these are the results in terms of the primary outcome. So we do see an improvement in the first six months of intervention on the standard of care diet. Uh, in terms of hemoglobin A1C, also when we measure it by the CGM, and also about a 20-30% uh, reduction in the time above uh, 140 on the standard of care uh, diet. Interestingly, if you look at what happens on the follow-up period, uh, hemoglobin A1C returns to baseline. In contrast, when we look at what happens on the algorithm diet, we're able to achieve much greater improvements in hemoglobin A1C, and, and what we're particularly excited about, uh, although not all participants so far have finished the 12 months, only the six months uh, uh, part has ended, is that the hemoglobin A1C uh, remains stable also in the follow-up period. 
the reduction as independently measured by the CGM is also greater, and, and we get about a 70% reduction in the time above 140, averaged across all 100 participants uh, in, in the study. Uh, to put this in context, the NIH performed a uh, landmark study, what's considered to be the gold uh, standard for people with uh, prediabetes. It was called the Diabetes Prevention Program. 3,000 participants randomized into three arms, either a, a placebo do-nothing arm or an arm where they were given metformin, the first-line medication in diabetes, uh, or uh, what they called the lifestyle arm, which was um, uh, an arm where they gave a similar diet to the one we gave, so a standard of care uh, Mediterranean type of diet, but they also gave caloric restriction, 500 calories per day of caloric restriction, and they also uh, advised for enhancing physical activity. So perhaps as expected, when you add these two additional components of caloric restriction and enhanced physical activity, you do better than uh, the standard of care diet that, that, uh, that we've measured. Uh, which is somewhere in between placebo and the lifestyle arm. But interestingly, with only a diet intervention that targets post-meal blood glucose levels, without caloric restriction, without enhancing physical activity, we're able to get an effect that is uh, much greater than that which you get by the lifestyle arm. And uh, to put this in, uh, in further uh, context, the uh, NIH also followed these participants four years after uh, advising uh, on the diets, and they saw that the lifestyle arm, this reduction that I showed here, the lifestyle arm was able to reduce the conversion from prediabetes to diabetes by 58% compared to placebo. So if we're getting a bigger effect, we're hopeful that we're able to lower the conversion from prediabetes to diabetes even further uh, on these diets. Um, several other secondary outcomes were also significantly improving better on the algorithm diet compared to uh, the standard of care diet like triglycerides. Fructosamine is, is just another independent shorter term, about a three-week uh, measure of uh, average uh, glucose levels, also uh, what's considered the, the um, ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol, also uh, significantly improved better on the algorithm diet as did uh, HDL cholesterol itself. Other parameters were not significantly different between the arms. However, if we look on the absolute level in terms of all the parameters, then uh, virtually all the metabolic parameters, including fasting glucose, uh, liver enzymes, even heart rate, uh, waist and hip circumference, uh, uh, triglycerides, and so on and so forth, all of these parameters uh, significantly improved on, um, on the algorithm diet. So, so in addition, so the big improvements on the primary outcomes were, were essentially improving all uh, metabolic outcomes. And this is also true if you measure this either per protocol. These are all participants who actually finished the study. And also if we, uh, if we properly control and include those participants uh, who dropped out, as we should include um, in proper analysis of uh, clinical trials. And also when we look at various subgroups, uh, uh, cutting by different by age or BMI groups and gender, uh, almost all of these are also um, uh, significantly better on the algorithm diet compared to the standard of care diet, even though when we subgroup, obviously, we have less statistical power because we're looking at less participants. So I'll just uh, summarize. Um, so I showed you on the uh, uh, clinical trial uh, that we did that the algorithm diet performs significantly better than the standard of care on all primary outcomes. Its uh, superiority is independent of weight loss because although there was mild weight loss on both arms, it was not statistically significant uh, uh, difference between, uh, between the arms. Uh, the algorithm diet and not the standard of care diet maintained these improvements even after 12 months. It performs better than the gold standard diabetes prevention program of the NIH. It improved nearly all metabolic parameters uh, that we examined and uh, we speculate, based on the larger reduction we're seeing compared to the lifestyle, that it may reduce uh, the conversion from prediabetes uh, to diabetes greater than uh, the lifestyle arm. So uh, with that, I'll uh, finish and just uh, thank the uh, many collaborators uh, that, uh, uh, that I had on this uh, study, and uh, especially the uh, people in my group who uh, led this work. And with that, uh, thank you for listening.